Thank you. Thank you, Wisconsin. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you all for being here. This is a fantastic crowd. And I greet, bring you greetings from your sister state in the Northeast, the state of Vermont. And uh, I've always believed, I've always believed that the state of Vermont and the state of Wisconsin have a lot in common. We are both progressive states. We both cherish our dairy farmers. And while Vermont has a better cheddar cheese than Wisconsin, yours is pretty good as well. Uh, let me thank, all right, we don't have to argue about cheddar, that's all right. We got other things to argue about. Uh, let me also thank uh, my dear friend Ed Garvey, not only for his work over the years in organizing uh, this event, along with so many other people, uh, but for his great service uh, as a fighting progressive, not only for Wisconsin, but for America. And my, my job this morning is, is very difficult because you have uh, already heard from some great speakers, and it's always hard to follow uh, people who get to the truth of the matter uh, and are effective in what they say, but I will do my best. And, and one of the reasons that I'm here this morning is I happen to believe that events like this are extremely important. And they are important, they are important because it is imperative that we never forget the history of our country, a history which sometimes the corporate media forgets to tell us about. It is a history of extraordinarily brave people who over the years have put their lives on the line and sometimes given their lives in the fight for justice, in the fight to abolish slavery, in the fight for civil rights, in the fight for women's rights and the ending of treating women as second-class citizens of the fight that's going on today, as we've just heard. The right to make sure that we end all prejudices against people because of their sexual orientation. So people have struggled and are struggling. And that's a history, that is a history that is as relevant to us today as it was then. And obviously, when we look back at some of the giants uh, in our country's history, people who fought for peace, fought for social justice, fighting Bob the Follett comes to mind, and you should be very proud of what he accomplished and the lessons that he gave us, not only in terms of public policy, but in how to win those struggles. And today, those lessons are important because we find ourselves in a momentous and pivotal moment in American history. We are facing the greatest economic challenge since the Great Depression of the 1930s. We are looking at a period in which millions of our brothers and sisters have lost their jobs, and in fact, well over 10% of our people today are unemployed, if you count those who have given up looking for work, and those who want to work full-time and are working part-time. When you look across the Midwest and you look at the state of Vermont, you see factories that used to produce meaningful products paying their workers a decent wage. Those factories are turning to rust. In Wisconsin, in the state of Vermont, farmers, dairy farmers, who have worked on their land for generations, generation after generation after generation, are now being thrown off of the land because of the disastrously low prices they're getting for their commodities, in our case, for milk. As a result of the greed and irresponsibility and illegal behavior of Wall Street, we are plunged into a horrendous crisis today that has disrupted the lives of millions of people from all walks of life. Think about the working elderly thinking about the people who are 60, 65, who have worked their entire lives to put away a few bucks for a dignified retirement, 
and as a result of the crash on Wall Street, that retirement is gone, and some of them are now packing groceries in supermarkets all over this country and are wondering how they're going to heat their homes this winter or provide for their basic necessities. Think about the millions of American workers who have lost their homes because of the scandalous behavior of Wall Street and all of those mortgage companies who ripped off people from one end of this country to another. And think, think about the young people who were looking forward to going to college and who came back home one day, maybe when they were in their senior year in high school, and their dad or mom said to them, sorry, we just no longer have the money to send you to college. And the financial crisis of Wall Street, which has had such a repercussion, disastrous repercussion all over this country, comes on the heels of a long trend in which the middle class has continued to decline. Let's not forget about it. It didn't start a year ago. That's just an exacerbation of what has happened for 30 years. This is America. In America, what we are seeing today is tens of millions of our brothers and sisters working longer hours for lower wages. People who used to work in manufacturing are now working in the service industry. They're making minimum wage and they don't have any health care. Now I remember there was a guy in a White House, the White House, for eight years. And some of you may remember that he told us that the fundamentals of the economy were strong. Remember that? The economy was robust. The economy was growing. And then a few months before he finally left office, after those long eight years, President Bush said, in essence, well, it appears that I made a, a slight mistake. It appears that the fundamentals of the economy were quite not so strong. But in fact, if Congress doesn't give us $700 billion in a couple of weeks, the financial system of the United States of America, and in fact all over the world, is going to collapse. We made a slight mistake. We said to our friends on Wall Street, we're going to deregulate you because we trust you. We love you. We know. We know that you're going to act for the best interest of the American people. So we're going to take away all restrictions. We're going to allow investment banks to merge with commercial banks to emerge to merge with insurance companies, and we know that you're going to create good-paying jobs all over this country. Well, it appears we may have made a slight mistake. And the main point that I think I want to make today, before I talk about what I think the progressive agenda should be, I think the main point that I want to make is that, in fact, the great crisis facing our country is not going to be cured by any single piece of legislation. The great crisis of this country is the incredible greed and selfishness which exists within the ruling elite of America. These people have no shame. They have no shame. For years, the CEOs on Wall Street were only making 10, 20, 50 million dollars a year at a time when America has the highest rate of childhood poverty in the industrialized world, but that was not enough for them. They need a billion dollars a year running hedge funds. They need to come up with exotic non-understandable financial instru instruments so that in fact Wall Street becomes a gambling casino in which the whole world is involved. And after their slicing and dicing 
after their greed, after their recklessness, after their illegal behavior, they plunged this country into a terrible recession. Have you heard one of these people, one of them, come before America and say, I am sorry? No. Not only have they not apologized for their action after taking hundreds of billions of your dollars, they're back to doing today what they did before the collapse of Wall Street. That is unacceptable. That has got to change. From a political perspective, I think it's fair to say that I and, and most of us believe in bipartisanship. We believe in people coming together to address the very, very serious problems facing our country. But to do political bipartisanship, you need the bi. You need a partner. And I think that it is time for the president for Congress and all of us to understand that we cannot keep reaching out to a Republican Party that has made it very clear that they are not serious about addressing the crises facing this country, but that they are simply into obstructionism and filibuster after filibuster after filibuster. The American people want bipartisanship, but more importantly, they want a solution to the crises that we're facing. The campaign of 2008 was about change. And if the Republicans do not want to engage in the effort to bring about change, then it's time for the majority to do it. That's what we're paid to do. Tom Harkin, a few minutes ago, said it better than I can. And he reminded us of a president that we had in the 1930s. And it was a president who had the understanding that if he explained the issues to the American people, if he pointed out who was responsible for the crisis, if he rallied the working class of this country around a progressive agenda, not only could he change public policy, but that he would win his election. And that is what we have got to do today. Barack Obama is a good friend of mine. I think he has the potential to be one of our great presidents. But he has got to learn the lessons of FDR. He has got to stand with the working families of this country and take on the big money interest. And when he does that, when he points the finger at Wall Street, at the insurance companies, at the drug companies, at the military and defense contract that was ripping off the taxpayers, at those people who are putting their money into the Cayman Islands and tax havens, when he points these things out, he will have the vast majority of the American people fighting at his side for progressive change. Now let me briefly tell you some of the efforts that we're trying to make uh, in the Senate. For a start, we need a thorough investigation of how Wall Street caused this crisis and we need to hold those people accountable. And instead of giving bonuses 
of $100 million a year, some of those people deserve to find out what our penal system is all about. For years, some of us have worked on dealing with the outrage of usury in America. You know what usury is about? Usury is not about lending money. Usury is about ripping off people and taking advantage of vulnerable people by charging them 25, 30, 40 percent interest rates on their credit card. We need a usury law in this country. For years now, for years now, our friends and the credit unions have been prohibited from charging more than 15 percent. They have done just fine. We've got to tell the credit card companies you can't charge more than 15 percent. A hundred years ago, Teddy Roosevelt had a pretty good idea. He looked around him and he saw monopoly after monopoly after monopoly and he said let's break them up yeah. now the reason the reason that the taxpayers of this country against my vote by the way forked over hundreds of billions of dollars to bail out wall street is that presumably some of these institutions were too big to fail well if they're too big to fail they're too big to exist Let's start breaking them up. As part of this bailout of Wall Street, our friends at the Fed decided that they would lend interest-free over $2 trillion. That's with a T, $2 trillion to the largest financial institutions in our country. I'm on the budget committee, and a number of months ago we had Chairman Bernanke coming before the committee, and I said, Ben, uh, who got the money? People back home are kind of interested, and he said, uh, I can't tell you. Can't tell you because it would indicate that these financial institutions had problems and there might be a run on those institutions. I said, well, you got an 800 number, for zero interest loans because a lot of folks in Vermont would like to take advantage of that. What do you think? 800 number, zero interest loans? And the good news, the good news is nobody has to know who you are. I think it's a pretty good deal. So I think that if it is good for the financial institutions to borrow trillions at zero interest, it's good enough for you. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we have got legislation in which, by the way, I think is going to pass. Legislation which is going to force the Fed to tell us who got that money. And when we talk about the economy and why the middle class is shrinking and why poverty is increasing, and why America has the most unequal distribution of wealth and income of any major country on earth with the top 1% owning more wealth than the bottom 90%, richest 1% earning more income than the bottom 50%. When we think about those issues, there is another issue that we've got to throw on the table, and that is our disastrous trade policies. It is not acceptable to me that corporate America throws millions of American workers out on the streets, runs to China, pays people their 50 cents an hour, and brings their products back into this country. We need corporate America to start investing in Wisconsin, in Vermont, and the other 48 states, and starting to create some decent paying jobs. Now, you've already heard a whole lot about health care, so I'm not going to go on for too long, but just to say a few things. It is clearly an international and moral disgrace 
that the United States of America, our great country, remains the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to every man, woman, and child. It is unacceptable, not only that 46 million have no insurance, but even more are underinsured with large co-payments and deductibles that they can't afford. And Wendell Potter made this point a moment ago, but it's worth repeating. All of us mourn the loss of 3,000 Americans who were killed and butchered on 9-11-01. But, but you should all understand that every single year, six times that number, at least 18,000, according to the Institute of Medicine, die because they don't have insurance and they don't get to the doctor on time. And when they do get to the doctor, it is too late. In my state of Vermont, I've talked to a number of physicians who have experienced that. People walk into the door and it's too late to cure them. So when people talk about death panels, that's a death panel. And at the end of the day, not only do we have so many people uninsured and underinsured and dying because they don't get to the doctor on time, at the end of that, we are spending almost twice as much per person on health care as any other country. And clearly, one of the major reasons that we are doing that is we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars hundreds of billions of dollars, I should say, every single year, not on primary health care doctors. We need primary health care doctors. We don't have enough. Not on dentists. We have a major crisis in dental care. Not on nurses. We have a major shortage of nurses. You know what we're spending our money on? We're spending on, on bureaucrats in the private health care industry who are telling us that we're not covered for what we paid for. That's where we're spending that money. And that is why I strongly believe in a single-payer Medicare for All program. We need... We need to put... We need to put our health care dollars into health care, not into bureaucracy. That's what we need to do. And the idea that we are spending 30 cents, 30 cents of every health care dollar on administration, on bureaucracy, on profiteering, on excessive CEO salaries, on paying the highest prices in the world for prescription drugs is totally absurd. Totally absurd. Now, I was just in England, funny thing, I was in England the other last week. And I came back and I gotta tell you a funny story. England does not have a single payer system. They have a socialized healthcare system. And which by the way covers all of their people at about half the cost per person that we spend. And here's the interesting point. I was at a meeting with uh, parliament, uh, members of parliament from all political parties. The conservative party the leadership and the members of the Conservative Party were outraged at the attacks on their National Health Service being propagated by the right wing in this country. The Conservatives there understand that health care is a human right for all people. Now, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the next weeks and months in Washington. I personally will be introducing an amendment on the floor of the Senate for a single-payer system. But at the very least, at the very, very, very least, we want a strong public option for all of our people. You know, I held uh, a number of town meetings on health care 
uh, in the state of Vermont. We held three huge, huge turnouts, uh, but the results were a little bit different than some of those meetings you saw on TV. In my state, and I'm sure in your state, the people, not all, not all, we had some conservatives who they raised their objection in a respectful way, I might say, but the vast majority of the people, in fact, want uh, health care uh, reform. But in the midst of those meetings, when somebody got up and they said, well, we hate government health care, I asked the simple question. I said, if you hate government health care so much, how many people here, and we had a couple of hundred conservatives out, how many of you want the government, the Congress, to abolish Medicare? Raise your hand. I had about three hands go up. How many of you want the government to abolish Veterans Administration health care? A few hands went up. How many of you want the government to abolish the S-CHIP program, which in my state is providing high quality health care to almost all the kids in our state? A couple of hands went up. Now, the truth of the matter is, we can do better with the VA. It is a good and strong system. We have made progress in recent years. I want to make it better. We can do better with Medicare. We can do better with Medicaid. We can do better with S-CHIP. But if you ask the tens and tens of the millions of Americans who are enjoying those programs, whether or not they want quote unquote government health care, or they want to go back to the wonderful arms of the private insurance companies, let me tell you, their answer is clear. They prefer public health care. And a last word, a last word on that issue. As a member of Congress, I have the same health care benefits that all federal employees have. It's not better and it's not worse. Same thing. And it's okay. It's not great. I, my family has Blue Cross Blue Shield. But within the Capitol, we pay extra. I want to make it clear. We pay for this. There's a clinic in the Capitol, not different from many other clinics in, in Wisconsin. And when you get sick or you want your flu shot or something, you go down to the clinic. And my guess is that almost every member of the United States Congress goes to that clinic gets very good health care. And you know who runs that health care facility? It's called the United States Navy. So the next time you see some right-wing guy getting on the floor denouncing government health care, ask him the last time that he went to that clinic. Let me just conclude on, on two other notes. Uh, I am on the Environmental Committee, and I'm on the Energy Committee. And in that capacity, we deal with the issue of global warming. To my mind, if the United States and the other countries of this world do not get their act together, the planet that we're going to be leaving, our kids and our grandchildren, is going to be a planet much less hospitable than the planet you and I are enjoying today. We're seeing the problems of global warming right now. It's very clear in terms of drought, in terms of flooding, in terms of extreme weather disturbances. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is if we do the right thing, if we are bold, and I must say that in the stimulus package, Obama's stimulus package, we have made some real progress. If we devote ourselves to energy efficiency, to such sustainable energy as wind, solar, geothermal, and biomass, in my view, over a period of years, we can create millions of good-paying jobs, cut back on greenhouse gas emissions, become energy independent. Become energy independent so that we don't need oil and wars in the Middle East. And lastly, in the midst of the war in Iraq, as we phase out a war clearly that we should never have been in the first place, a war that will end up costing us not only so many lives, young men and women who will never return to their families, tens of thousands who have been wounded, and a cost of perhaps $3 trillion when the last dollar is paid. And now we are in another war. 
And my view is that we need to take a very, very hard look at that war in Afghanistan. We need to be very clear about our goals, and most importantly, we need an exit strategy as to when we bring our troops home. Let me conclude by just saying this. Brothers and sisters, these are momentous moments uh, for our country, no question about it. If you look at the panoply of problems we are facing today in terms of the economy, healthcare, global warming, a huge national debt, education, maldistribution of wealth and income, if you look at those problems, they are really kind of mind-boggling. The only way we ever win is when working people, middle-class people, lower-income people come together to fight for justice, to fight for the rights of all of our people. So I think we are clearly engaged, and previous speakers have made this point, that on the other side there are folks who are spending unbelievable sums of money in Washington. They own much of the media, and it is not going to be easy. But at the end of the day, if we stand together around a progressive agenda, if we make sure that every working person in this country votes for their own interest and not for the interest of Wall Street or the insurance companies. There is no limit to what we can accomplish as a nation. And there's no doubt in my mind, if we stand together, if we are prepared to fight, not a doubt in my mind that the world we leave to our kids and our grandchildren will be a better world than it is today. Thank you all very much.